This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 89, recorded on July 2nd, 2010. Hi everybody, it's Vincent Yellow, and this is TWIV, your weekly dose of virology. And joining me today to talk about viruses from Western Massachusetts is none other than Alan Dove. Good to be back. Who else is in Western MA but Alan Dove? Uh, not a whole lot of folks. I, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that. There's <laughs> quite a few people out there. Yeah, there are. There are. There's... This uh, podcast will be released on July 4th, which, of course, is an important date in American history. For those of you in in the United States, it was in 1776 on that day that the Congress approved splitting away from Great Britain, Declaration of Independence. And if you're not in the U.S., well, you're missing out on the barbecues. That's right. I'll I'll crack open a bottle of Sam Adams to celebrate. seems like the appropriate way. That's a good way. That's an old beer, right? It's a new beer, but... um, With an old history? Named after named after a guy who was involved in that whole thing. The first colonists landed in Massachusetts, right? Um, yeah, more or less. It depends on who you count as first, but um, but yeah, the the Mayflower group is generally considered one of the pioneering sets. Massachusetts, and you are living in a cradle of history there. Yes, indeed. Well, speaking of cradles of history, I. I actually became a tourist this week in New York City and took a circle line cruise. Oh, I never I never did that. Neither had I. I've been here for ages. And a circle line for those of you who don't know is a boat that travels around the island of Manhattan. I've actually gone around the island of Manhattan on a boat, but not the circle line. Oh, well, that's good. Well, these circle lines are cool. They have a guide who talks and gives you history, which is actually quite good. So I highly recommend it. To anyone who visits New York, you can. I would do the three-hour tour. It goes entirely around the island. The three-hour tour. <laughs> and anyway, this fellow, for some reason, was talking about Springfield. Oh. And uh, he said it's one of the most common cities in America. Ah, uh, but <laughs> yes. the one in western Massachusetts, the one right next to the town where I live, is the first Springfield in the United States. Is that right? And the biggest. Huh. Yes. Well, there you go. That's why you're there. So we invented Springfield. We also invented <laughs> basketball here. That's right. Yeah. And aren't yeah. you near the Basketball Hall of Fame? It is right in Springfield. Wow. Cool. That's neat. Well, anyway, if you take a circle on, you learn a lot of interesting historical tidbits. And uh, next week, when Rich Condit is back on Twiv, we'll, I'll tell you about another one that I learned on the trip. Okay. Speaking of Rich Condit, he is away. He's at a meeting. He will be back next Friday. Dixon de Pommier is away. He will not be back next Friday. <laughs> He's always away. He's a guy who's retired, and I see him less than before. <laughs> so he's been traveling since I don't know, quite a while ago. He went out west somewhere. He'll be back. He's flying back on the 9th, so he will be back that following week, and I don't know if he'll join us for TWIV or not. He's trying to build a vertical farm, so he's kind of wrapped up on that. Right. Between the vertical farming and the fly fishing, he seems to keep pretty busy. That's right. He is busy. He's a happy man. Well, that's good. But here on TWIV, we talk about viruses, and there's never a shortage of viruses to talk about. As we heard from Graham Hatful, (laughs) these are his words, they are the most numerous living entity on the planet. Of course, we didn't correct him, right? Right. Those couldn't be your words because you wouldn't have said living. (laughs) Wouldn't have said living. Uh, the most numerous. I don't know what you would say. What would be the right? Way I to would say, say I would say life form. Um, I have no problem saying that they're they're a form of life. You know what's interesting? I, I read a paper recently, and I think we might discuss this next week. The idea being that the virion is not living, but when it gets into a cell, then it becomes living. There's a fellow in France who has put forth this idea that. When the virus infects the cell, then it becomes alive. It takes over mm. the cell, so the vi- the cell is basically the virus, and that's the living thing. Right. And then it can reproduce and evolve and so forth. The virion, he said, he said we shouldn't focus on the virion. 
It's nothing. It's just a package of genes. It's actually in the cell that where it counts. Okay. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Now, before we go on to virology, since <clears throat> since you're no longer on Twitter, I thought you would be interested in a uh, a tweet from Drobo on Twitter this week. That's from Mark, right. a friend of Drobo. He he wrote three words I didn't expect to hear on Twiv eighty eight bash emacs vim. <laughs> <laughs> Who spoke them? Is it Prof VRR, AlanDove.com, or Mark Pelletier? Guilty as charged. I would think he would recognize your voice. Yeah. It is yeah, distinctive. I thought I was distinctive enough. Yeah, uh, that's probably the first time we've mentioned those words. I think I may have mentioned Emacs at some point on a previous yeah. episode for a, for an organizational tool that I was using in, in that. That's um, possibly true, yes. But yes, that was a snapshot of my... Uh, my, some of my particularly nerdy hobbies. I uh, did a tweet and I told him it was you. So would you consider yourself a hacker? Um, I guess. You know, I, in the good I don't, sense. Yeah, I don't, have, I don't have extraordinary skills at it, but uh, I have a tendency to want to fix things that bother me. And, and that, you know, since I work on a computer a lot, that leads me into doing little bits and pieces of programming. Usually it's kind of a hacksaw and duct tape approach. I, <laughs> I just go in and I and I smash things until they, I get the effect I want. Um, but uh, but yeah, I've I've written some scripts. I've uh, done a little little of this, little of that, and and I do use programming tools in my at, for my writing, um, mm -hmm. which a lot of writers don't bother with. But uh, but I find text editors are really really useful. You might like Gina Trapani. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. She is at. She sounds really familiar. She's a, she's a programmer. She's at um, smarterware.org. I mean, she has a to-do list, which is done in a text window, you know, with, with the stuff that you are into. So okay. She, she writes all these. Uh, she, she writes, she's a programmer, but she does a lot of this um, Emacs, Vim. Ah, founding stuff. editor of Lifehacker. That's yeah. where I remember, yes. <clears throat> and I know, I've heard, I've listened to podcasts on which she appears, and she's always talking about. She has a to-do list, which is written in this um, one of these very basic terminal programs. Is it org mode in Emacs? Something like that, you know. Yeah. And she wrote her own, and you know, so she just types something, and it comes up on her terminal window. So that's the kind of thing you would like. Yeah, definitely. Today we have uh, a couple of very interesting stories. The first one is about the retrovirus XMRV, which is just burning up. The internet this past week. I have a news search for for XMRV, and this is just incredible. There's so many stories, and that is because there's been some activity in the past week. Now, let's see. Let's review a bit about XMRV. XMRV, of course, is a new retrovirus first discovered in prostate cancer tissues uh, from humans, uh, I think, in 2006, and it is highly related to endogenous retroviruses of mice, the so-called murine leukemia viruses, MLVs. So first picked up in prostate cancer, and then last year in a study published in Science, uh, detected in a large fraction of samples from patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS. CFS is a, um, it's a very serious disease about Half to two percent of people in the U.S. seem to be afflicted. It's a variety of uh, syndromes, including severe fatigue, um, cognitive disturbances, um, a variety of other symptoms. And it has been suggested. We don't know what causes CFS, but it's been suggested over the years that a variety of viruses are involved in. That's the most recent one, XMRV. So it was in 68 out of 101 samples in the science paper were positive for um, XMRV. And but that, only about 3% of the controls. 3% of the controls, which the in itself people. is uh, disturbing, suggesting it's sure. in right. blood of uh, healthy people as well. Right. So that was quite an interesting observation. And of course, it doesn't. it didn't mean that the virus caused CFS, but it was a very, very interesting 
association. And so what remained to be done was for many other groups to do the same study, right? Right. So it would be very interesting if CFS were caused by a specific virus, then you could treat it. You could diagnose it and treat it. Right. But we're still at the, the point of that discovery. We're still about three steps away from being able to conclude that. Absolutely. Now and the they're big steps. The thing is that, of course, people who have had the disease for many years are very anxious to have something, right? Right. So they have, they have embraced that report very strongly. Yes. And there's been a lot of very emotional arguing back and forth. And part of the issue is now there were a couple of subsequent studies in the UK and in the Netherlands using mainly PCR to look for the virus in chronic fatigue patients, and they were all negative. Right. And we did talk about them on TWIV. And that spurred a lot of uh, arguing back and forth among the groups the group who published in Science from the WPI, the Whitmore. Oh, I'm going to get it wrong again now. Whitmore, Whitmore Peterson Institute. Whitmore, I'm just, I happen to be looking at a news article on it right now. Thank you. Whitmore Peterson Institute. They're very adamant that they're correct and that everyone else is wrong. And the others, of course, saying, "Hey, we know how to do science." So a lot of and and it's worth pointing out that the the WPI is in the business of treating chronic fatigue. So it's a double-edged sword. They're simultaneously very expert in the condition, but also they have a vested interest in being right about right. this particular diagnosis. So this week, um, apparently there were a couple of papers in press on additional studies. And this week, one of them was leaked. So the, the author on one is Harvey Alter. And apparently he had presented uh, in a meeting in Prague in May, he had presented a f the fact that he had found, he, had, he said he confirmed the WPI study. And in fact, his slide presentation has been circulating around the internet. And I have a copy of it right here. And his slide says the data in the science manuscript are likely true despite the controversy. Um, the association with CFS is very strong, but causality not proved. And then he says XMRV and related MLVs are in the donor supply with an early prevalence estimate of 3 to 7%. And then finally, we have independently confirmed the Lombardi group findings. And that last little bullet point is what set off the firestorm. Yeah. So um, this is apparently it has been accepted for publication in, the, in PNAS. Right. Right. And um, then at the same time, it was leaked that a separate study by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control in the U.S., is in press in a different journal, Retrovirology. And that, that was a negative study. They found no XMRV in, in their samples. Right. Okay. So at that point, both journals decided not to go forward with publishing, right? Right. <laughs> and uh, I... I think they did it independently, but I'm not sure. Well, and there was also the um, the CDC, the FDA, and the NIH are all um, under the under the purview of the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And so, Health and Human Services (HHS) um, wanted to be able to have some kind of consistent message about what all these data mean. Um, Without, you know, without trying to spin anything, they just want to, they understand that this is a very controversial issue that is being already applied by a lot of folks to argue a lot of things that are, that are going to have clinical impact. Um, and so HHS was in an awkward position of having uh, one hand say one thing and the other hand say the other thing um, mm. simultaneously. Right. And so I, th I think they may have, um, they may have asked that the papers be held while they figured out um, what was going on. So overnight, the retrovirus paper was published. I think CD yes. CDC decided they would, I don't know if they decided, but I read that they decided they could go forward with it. But at any rate, it was published. So we have that manuscript now. The PNAS manuscript is not yet out. CDC has a reputation for not having a high tolerance for bureaucratic niceties. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> they, may have, they may have just said the science is good, let's go. Well, my view is that if you've peer reviewed the papers, you should publish them. Sure. Yeah, I don't I I, I just explained 
the the bit about HHS maybe wanting to hold these back, but I don't think that that was actually a legitimate rationale. I think yeah. if you've got researchers who are doing the work and researchers reviewing it and it's been peer reviewed and it's ready to be to be published, then it should go. Yep. And the the papers should be out there so that we can actually look at the data. Exactly. Particularly, you know, right now we've got the retrovirology paper, the Switzer et al. paper. Um, we have the whole thing. It's out there. We've got the data. I'm looking at it right now. It's open access. Um, right. So anybody can click in the show notes and go to it and read the whole thing if they like. Um, and that is, that's what you need to be able to do to evaluate science. Whereas the, um, um, you know, the other, the FDA, NIH, the alter data, we have one bullet point in one slide. The slide hasn't even been publicly released. So right. <laughs> this is this is not the appropriate way to compare no, data. No. I, I'd say the problem is when you leak stuff, then you can't evaluate it. Then yeah, then be, and you have a lot of rumor and hearsay, and that really clouds everything. We need to have the data. We have the retrovirology paper here. We can talk about this, but um, I think but they I should, should both be I, out. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think. Um, and we're not blaming uh, Alter for this, because um, no. as far as I know, he was he presented these slides um, in a closed session at a meeting, and the usual understanding at those closed sessions is that nothing from them is supposed to be reported. It's for researchers to get together and talk in privacy, and you know they may say things that the general public wouldn't be able to understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's what happened here, and that that really never should have gotten out until the paper came out. I guess you can assume that any closed session would will leak, right? Um, because we have I have copies of uh, his slides, basically. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it obvi obviously, it did leak. We're both looking at copies of the slides from the closed session. I don't but, know what happened. Um. Yeah, I, usually uh, as a journalist, I've and it, obviously as a scientist, I was I was at closed meetings, and then as a journalist, I've been to them as well. And when I go in with my journalism hat, um, that's not literal, by the way. Um, I I either have to sign or orally agree to not releasing anything that comes from it. Uh, and if I were to violate that agreement, then I I'd, I'd be in a, a heap of trouble. Mm, sure. But someone does violate it, obviously. Yeah, if the motivation is high enough and yeah. the data are controversial enough, as this topic is, um, you know, some people are, are a little more ethically negotiable than others. So the CDC study is the first, they say, the first done in the U.S. since the WPI study of last year. They look at archived blood specimens from people in Kansas and Georgia. And they have um, 50, let's see, um, where are the numbers? Mm, 51 people with CFS and 56 healthy people. And they also looked at blood, 121 U.S. blood donors and 26 HTLV and HIV infected sera. So this is on an order of the size of the Lombardi et al. study, yeah. right? Yeah. They used Western blood assays. Where they run, uh, they fractionate viral proteins on a gel, transfer them to a membrane, and then hybridize them with sera. And if there are antibodies in the sera, these are from the patients, they would react with the viral proteins. And in that case, there was no reactivity in any of the samples. So Western blot negative. They also sent uh, these samples to the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin. They blinded them. And in, at the Koch Institute, they used an ELISA, an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, where you can put the viral proteins on a plastic surface and then add the serum. And if the antibodies bind, you can then detect them by various colorimetric or uh, chemical reactions. And those were negative. And then they also did polymerase chain reaction at CDC we're using a variety, two different PCR assays, which they say are very sensitive. They could detect 10 copies of viral DNA in a microgram of human DNA. And uh, they say it also could detect if the viruses have varied a bit. They could detect, you know, viruses with sequence changes. And they were all negative by that assay as well. 
So this is all negative. And they also sent the PCR out to the Blood Systems Research Institute. Ah, yes. Good point. Uh, so they had San the Francisco. PCR. They had the, they did the Western blot themselves. They sent the ELISA out uh, to the Koch Institute. They did PCR themselves, and then they set, p- sent PCR out to uh, BSRI. Right. And the Blood Systems Research Institute is actually where um, Rich and I were a few weeks ago. Right. And in fact, Eric Delwart had had surreptitiously said they were doing something with CDC, but he didn't say what. <laughs> and this is it. Yes, apparently. And uh, they conclude, we did not find any evidence of infection with XMRV in our U.S. study population of CFS patients or healthy controls. These data do not support an association of XMRV with CFS. Right. Now, what? Uh, why are, is is uh, is everyone getting different results? So they actually have a quite good discussion here, where they go into some of the possibilities. Of course, um, the methodology could be different, but to me, this looks pretty solid. I think if there were some viral sequences present, they would detect them. I don't have a problem with that. Perhaps the viruses in these patients are different enough that they might not be detected. Could be. Could be. In which case, they should do deep sequencing of the samples to find out what's in them. Maybe there are regional differences. Yeah, absolutely. My feeling, and now tell me what you think about this. My feeling is that the case definition is really the, the clincher here. Uh, apparently, these CFS patients, the way they were, they were selected is different from the way the Lombardi study patients were selected. Right, And they actually say here, the selection criteria with which persons with CFS were included in these various studies may help to explain the incongruent XMRV findings. You know, there's no diagnostic test for CFS. Right. Can't do a lab test. And so you depend on a variety of criteria, and there are several different groups of criteria. There's the Canadian criteria, and uh, uh, there are there are others which... They're escaping me at the moment. Here we go. The 1994 International CFS Case Definition, the Canadian Consensus Criteria. There's the CDC Case Definition, which was used in this paper. Uh, The 2003 Canadian Consensus. So I would guess that that could be a confounding factor. What do you think about that? It could be. Um, What puzzles me about this one, though, um, the, the Switzer et al. paper, the new one, is they found it nowhere. Yeah, not even in... Um, you know, in controls, Lombardi, right? Lombardi et al. found 3% in the general population, just in healthy controls. And here they screen a similar number of people, uh, a sim- similar number of people, and it's not to be found. Yeah. And they did look, I mean, this is a, they really scoured things here. Um, the PCR is very sensitive. They, they replicated everything. It's a solid study and they just can't find the darn thing. Um, which I, to me, it suggests there may be some kind of regional distribution going on. Um, you know, you notice the, the two of the earliest negative papers on on CFS and um, prostate cancer with XMRV were from Europe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and they got very resoundingly negative results. You know, no support for any association between these. Uh, and one of the things that they suggested was maybe European populations don't have this virus. Yeah. Well, the, I was just reading uh, Judy Mikovits' letter in Science, where she was responding to some of these negative studies, and she said that her original science study actually had patient samples from all over the U.S., not just from Nevada. Right. So if that's the case, then it wouldn't be regional. It could be U.S. versus right. Europe, for example. Right. Except that their if their samples did have some kind of regional skew. Um, yeah. I mean, you notice that the the positive paper, it wasn't 100% of people with CFS. It was 67%. Sure. So there may be something up with that. Um, yeah, I think that could be. I, I think also the uh, the case definition or how you yes. how you sort out your patients Absolutely. probably plays a role as well. And, yeah, I and, think... Sorry, go ahead. I think there needs to be a lot more... Um, I think there needs to be some exchanging of samples to check the techniques, you know, control for the methods. And I think people also need to, um, 
uh, calm down a little bit about this whole thing. It's not, it's not that anybody is trying to, to deceive or trying to, uh, um, angle things a particular way it's just that the actual data that that are showing up are very very ambiguous yeah i blogged about this um the other day and the comments are amazing to say the least um, i saw that there are more than i've seen in such a short time for anything on any post i've ever made and you can see there's a lot of anxiety. People don't trust the CDC or NIH. Um, well, yeah. You know, they, they think they're up to something, but, you know, I, I don't know anything, and I don't have the disease, so I'm not as emotional about it. But Right, I and think, this, is, this is a disease that has been very politicized. Absolutely. Uh, because it's so difficult to diagnose, because the case definition is all over the map, because... Uh, you know, some people have vested interests in various outcomes, and and I think a lot of the patients with it, um, when the Lombardi study came out, they latched onto it and decided, well, this must be the truth. And yeah. of course, that's not how science works. Right. Well, those were pretty good numbers, but still, they. Uh, and in fact, if you go back to that original paper, they don't say that the virus causes no. CFS. They said here's a possibility, and let's look at it. Right. The first thing you have to establish is that there's a correlation. We haven't even done that yet. But then after you establish a correlation, it's a long way to go to determine that that's a cause. That's right. Now, one thing um, I wanted to point out on this study that we discussed, the CDC study, there are no positive controls in the form of a sample, a patient sample that is known to be XMRV positive. Right. And I personally don't feel it's really useful to continue with these studies unless you include those positive controls. Right. That means WPI is going to have to give out some samples, and I don't know if they're willing to do that or not. But if personally, it, this kind of a study doesn't make a lot of sense unless you have that to me. And I think it sh the reviewers should have asked for it. Yeah, and that's why I say there has to be some exchanging of samples right. here. I, I know these are precious samples in many cases, but... Um, you know they really they really need to get together on this and and it would be in the interest of WPI to do that i read in science magazine that uh, nih is putting together a large multi-center blinded study where many samples in the WPI will be involved cdc fda and other groups they're all going to test a, a defined group of samples and see what happens and that's probably what we need right absolutely and that, they said, will probably be done by the end of the year. So not going to happen overnight. Yeah, you're not going to get this answer if you keep testing different populations of 100 people in different labs. No. no. It just makes people frustrated, which is what we see is happening now, right? Yes. And they don't now they hate the CDC, you know. And it's not productive emotional energy being spent. Right. Um, I'm, well, we'll see what the PNAS paper looks like. It might, if it comes out this week, we'll... We'll talk about it next week. So apparently um, that is a positive study, and we'll see what they looked at, what patient samples and uh, how they did the assays. Right. And there you go. That's the latest on XMRV. There's also a couple of articles in Science we'll post links to. I don't know if people will be able to read them, but... I think the news article, one of the ones that I linked to is, is, public, yeah. is publicly accessible. Yeah. Hard for me to tell here, but... I guess you would know, right? Because you would. Yeah, I, I have to log in separately yeah. in order to get in. Okay, our next story has to do with with influenza. Remember that we haven't talked about that in a while. Oh, I've heard of flu by th this time last year. It's all we were talking about. Yeah, it was July of two thousand nine. It was uh, there was a flu outbreak in the U.S. and pandemic flu, and that's very unusual because now, as we see, there's no influenza here. It's all in the southern hemisphere. But we actually have two papers on uh, influenza, which are quite interesting. And the first is has to do with uh, H1N1 in pigs. Let me find my article. And it's called, it's a science article called Reassortment of Pandemic H1N1 2009 Influenza A Virus in Swine. And this is a very short article, one page, which is lovely. <laughs> Yeah, I love the science brevia articles. It's, it's such a brilliant idea. So that's it, one-page articles? It's a one-page article, make your point and go. And and of course, they're reviewed, right? Oh, they're yeah, they're peer-reviewed articles. They're just, um, they're short. Yeah. And, and 
on average, they seem to be very interesting. Hmm. Because if you're going to make a point in one page, you got to be saying something interesting. It's a good exercise for otherwise verbose scientists, right? Yes. Well, this one is a group from Hong Kong. And um, what they have been doing for the past 10 years is isolating influenza viruses from pigs in uh, abattoirs, which is where they kill them, right? Right. And so that's 10 years of surveillance. And over that time, they uh, have isolated 32 H1N1 and H1N2 viruses in fortnightly surveys. It's a fortnight, 14 days. It's two weeks. Yes, you don't hear that term very often. Oh, that's because it's Hong Kong, right? British. Uh, right, it's British, yes. From June 2009 to February 2010, 32 viruses were isolated. And then starting in October last year, they isolated 10 of the pandemic H1N1 viruses from on four of eight sampling occasions. So they're all swine origin that the, of, the, of the ilk that uh, circulated in us last year. So this is the human pandemic virus now gone back into pigs. So they were able to isolate that virus. And I think a few other uh, places in the world, the virus has been isolated from pigs. So it can go back into pigs and it can replicate in them. And they also have evidence that these viruses uh, can transmit within the herd. And that there are also independent introductions from humans into the herd. So the way the, these pigs are getting the virus is from the handlers, I presume the handlers that get very close to them when they're feeding or cleaning. They're coughing, and they transmit the virus right back to the pigs. So that's since October 2009. Now, here's the interesting part. You know, these pigs in Hong Kong have all the th all of the different kinds of swine viruses, influenza viruses. So there's the classical swine H1N1 viruses. Those are the direct descendants of the 1918 H1N1 virus. Those are called classical swine viruses. And we, then they have European avian-like H1N1. And these are H1N1 viruses that went into pigs more recently from birds. In fact, there's a wonderful article in the New England Journal that has um, the, the uh, origins or the history of all these swine viruses. So those are called... Uh, avian-like, European avian-like. And then the triple reassortant viruses uh, are also in Hong Kong. And these are viruses, swine influenza viruses. They're H1N2s that have genes from birds, humans, and pigs. That's why they're called triple reassortants. So they have all kinds of, all, all of the known swine viruses are there. In January of this year, they, they isolated a reassortant of the 2009 H1N1 virus. It picked up genes from these other swine viruses. So basically, because the pigs are infected with all sorts of swine viruses, they, they reassort their genes. And now the 2009 H1N1 has picked up some genes from these other influenza viruses in pigs. So that is not surprising because it show, we know that when you are co-infected with multiple influenza viruses, they do reassort genes. And so this is not surprising, but it can happen, obviously. And they actually show here that um, the vaccine against last year's pandemic H1N1 virus does not confer protection against this new reassortant, which is derived from the pandemic virus. So that's quite interesting. Right. And that's because the hemagglutinin gene is from a different swine virus, not the pandemic, the human pandemic virus. So the implication is that this pandemic virus can go into pigs and acquire other genes and maybe someday come back out again and infect people. And they say, well, you know, the, H, the avian H5N1 and H9N2 viruses can infect pigs and they could reassort with the, the pandemic H1N1 and make new viruses, which is all absolutely possible. And... Um, but what they do say that I do take issue with at the last two sentences, the 2009 pandemic, although mild and apparently contained at present, could undergo further reassortment in swine and gain virulence. Hmm. All right. Why does it have to gain virulence? That's not <laughs> what it wants to do. It wants to be more transmissible, right? Right. 
And if it happens to be virulent at the same time, okay, but it's not doesn't evolve to keep to be more virulent unless that happens that affects transmission. Well, the sentence is correct. It could evolve to be more virulent, but there's no any a priori reason to believe that it would. You're right. It could. There's a remote possibility. It's so remote though, if you only have a page. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I believe I believe the British term for this is sexing it up. Yeah, right. So then the, the <laughs> next sentence is therefore important that surveillance in swine be greatly heightened, right? Which, of course, they would like because they're doing the work and they want to have continuous money to do it. So this brings up the question. All right, we have a pandemic strain, which is probably going to be infecting us for at least the next 10 years, right? So who's watching your pigs? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to watch pigs for the next 10 years. That's fine. But it's not going to. we're not going to have a new pandemic strain in a year or two. Right. At least history tells us that's not what happens, right? It takes at least 10 years for reasons that are uh, are, are uh, not really known, right? I mean, why can't the totally different virus come out next year against which we, we don't have immunity? That doesn't seem to happen. You know, the strain is going to be established. It's going to circulate for a long time, and maybe in 10, 15, 20 years or more, another one will come out. Now, it could come from pigs, and it could come from these sorts of reassortants. And I totally support screening pig herds for this to get an idea of what's in there. But, sure. Um, I yeah, I, I actually I agree with the idea that we should um, screen pigs um, on a, on a more regular basis or on a regular basis to uh, um, see what they're carrying and see what strains of flu are circulating and um, kind of have a better handle on that. And and yeah, that could be very useful in predicting whether a pandemic strain is in the works. Yeah. But I just want people to understand that this is not, this is not something happening in a year or two. Okay. This is a long-term issue that these viruses may pop back out of pigs and, and back into us. Most likely. Yes. Not uh, So uh, yeah. Okay. So we should, sw we should definitely screen the pigs, but don't worry about it right now. Right. The uh, last paper is something you picked up. Flu doesn't die out. It hides out. Yes. And this is a, a cool, um, I, I don't normally gravitate too much to mathematical modeling papers. Um, and my, it reaches the limits of my math pretty quickly. But uh, this was a, an interesting result. And from what I can tell, they did the study pretty, pretty thoroughly. Um, so <clears throat> this is, uh, we were just talking about H1N1. This is H3N2 flu. So this is the... Um, regular seasonal flu that we get every year and we get different strains of it circulating and the model has been the theory has been that new strains of flu originate usually in southeast asia and china and they then travel the world um you know be a virus see the world they they come from china out to the united states and europe and then to latin america australia etc and as the seasons change in those temperate parts of the world, um, then that virus dies out. And you get a new set of strains coming out the next year. So that's been the model, is that the, the virus, um, there's a source in China and the rest of the world is kind of a sink for the virus, that it survives a season and then dies out. Uh, so what these folks did was they... Um, it's a database paper. They, they went to GenBank and they looked up flu sequences, H3N2 flu sequences from strains collected around the world between 1998 and 2009. So they've got 11 years of data here. They have um, uh, about 5,000, um, it's about 5,000 sequences that they looked at. And their standards for including a sequence in this study were it had to have. Um, specific geographic data um, and information about where the sample was collected so that they could include it on a map. Um, and then they looked at genetic diversity in um, the hemagglutinin. And they uh, normally what you would think of doing at this point is constructing a phylogenetic tree. And people have done that in the past. They've taken HA sequences and constructed phylogenetic trees of the virus. Um, sort of from first principles, what was likely to have evolved from what. 
the approach here was a little different, and here's where we get to the limits of my mathematical abilities. Um, <clears throat> they used um, what they call a structured coalescent model, um, and uh, I believe the approach <clears throat> is that they construct a lot of possible trees and then see which one fits the data best, mm -hmm. rather than trying to reason forward from the genetic changes that they see in the virus. And the conclusion they come to is they construct a, a likely, or the, what they, they view as the most likely um, movements mm -hmm. for the virus around the world. So you can see a strain that shows up in China, and then it shows up in the United States, and you see that they're very closely related, and you see, you know, slightly different version travels to Latin America and so on. Uh, and they put together a map of all of this stuff. Um, and this is an open access paper. It's in PLOS Pathogens. Um, the, uh, this is the May 27th issue, and it's Bedford et al. Um, and the figure, the map, uh, is is it looks like an airline map <laughs> you know it's like you <clears throat> pick up the brochure on continental airlines and and there here are our routes um and of course that's not coincidental uh that's probably one of the major ways yeah, that influenza sure. travels yeah. <clears throat> um at least in humans i, I guess pigs fly too right? <laughs> that's right they do <laughs> um so <clears throat> the what's interesting about this is they they argue that instead of seeing a source in China and a sink for the virus in the rest of the world, what you see is the virus originating in China, so it is indeed a source, yeah. and then it travels out, goes to you know U.S., Japan, Europe, uh, South America, but then it seems to stay in those places in some of the tropical latitudes, and continues to circulate um, back and forth a bit. Yeah. So there's yeah. exchange between those countries. It's not all just coming from Asia and going out to the world. The rest of the world, particularly the U.S., um, is serving as as nodes in this network yeah. um, that are then feeding the virus back. And in fact, we send virus back to China and Japan and Southeast Asia. Um, so the theory and again this is a mathematical modeling study they haven't actually gone and proven that this is what's happening but it, it mm. certainly seems like pretty strong evidence that the virus is hiding out in warm latitudes um potentially coming back to the temperate zones which may be why we don't see a whole new set of strains coming out every year yeah yeah they have a very nice map here um which shows so originally they were thinking that China was the major source, but they also show that you, the U.S., as you say, is a major source going back and forth. Right. Interestingly, South America seems to only get it from the U.S. Right. We seem to be their sole, uh, their sole importer. Although they say that um, this conclusion is contingent upon the restricted temporal and spatial patterns of viral sampling. So I guess... You know, right. there, there aren't as many sequences from South America that may that may bias the findings. So there may be, you know, it's it's probably not realistic that there isn't any flow from South America elsewhere. Right. That's a sampling problem. But they do say that the migration network correlates with air travel. Yep. And then they say, interestingly, although the world has become tightly connected through travel, it appears that influenza sweeps through local populations fast enough to sustain substantial geographical population structure on a continental scale. So in other words, you don't need air travel, right? Right. For it to spread. And in fact, in the 50s, when there was much less air travel, the pandemic strain spread quite rapidly anyway. And in 1918, it spread around the world in a single season. Yeah. Without and there was air, no air travel. No airplanes at all. It's pretty <clears> cool. <throat> this is a neat study. They uh, There are a couple of things they say that are very interesting. They say, first of all, since the U.S. is an epicenter, if we use a lot of antivirals here, we could spread resistant viruses globally, right? Drug-resistant viruses. Right. And we apologize to the geologists for misusing the term epicenter. <laughs> What's the correct uh, definition? Well, an epicenter is very specifically, it's the... Um, the point on the Earth's surface that is directly above 
the center of an earthquake. All right, so that's the that's only the, definition it should have, yeah. Right, that's what the epi part means. It's on top of. Okay, so it has nothing so to do with it. It's on top of the center. So we're not, a, we're not an epicenter. We're not okay. on top of the center. We're a center. We're a center. Okay, we, we are a center, and from us spreads, spread influenza viruses right. and, uh, and back eventually. Right, so our, our use of antivirals um, could certainly affect the strain. Yeah, and also they say uh, if, we, if we do a good job vaccinating, we could curb the spread to other parts of the world, right? Sure. If the U.S. were 100% immunized, and then it would, the rest of the world would benefit. Right. So that would be cool. And then they say that uh, we might be able to tailor vaccine design to specific areas of the globe. So if most flu in South America comes from the U.S., that means we could immunize South America with U.S. strains. Right. right. The same way if we could speed up the the vaccine production process especially, yeah. um, the same way that we now have people going to China to figure out what strains are circulating there to come up with the vaccine for the U.S., maybe we could have people in the U.S. screening the strains here and turning around a vaccine quickly enough to know, to get it to South America. Right. So the bottom line is that at the end of our flu season, the virus has gone elsewhere in the globe. And then when our flu season uh, comes back, those viruses come back to us, right? So they don't die out per right. se. They go somewhere else. And that's the that's where that original uh, catchy title came from, which was an, a Eureka Alert title. Flu doesn't die out. It hides out. Right. Okay. That's very cool. I like that. So it's modeling, right? And but Right. Allows you to do some testing. Yep. All right. And now we shall do some email. The first one is from Andreas. Hello, professors. You're a professor now, Alan. Oh, wow. I would just like to start by saying thank you for the wonderful podcast. Today I found this article on NPR, which seems to describe a remarkably effective antiviral treatment for Ebola. The article has virologist Heinz Feldman expressing concerns that the drug, though very effective, is unlikely to be brought to market due to the lack of financial incentives. What's your take on this? So this is a, actually, it's an it's a uh, experimental drug. It is using a couple of SI RNAs, small interfering RNAs, wrapped up in a uh, lipid package injected into monkeys, and it protects them from Ebola lethality. If you give them something, this is injected intravenously. So again, these SI RNAs target viral RNA, and it targets the viral RNAs to the cell machinery that would then degrade it so that they're acting uh, like an antiviral in a way. Small interfering RNAs against the viral RNA polymerase. So it would destroy the RNA, encoding the polymerase so the virus can't replicate. They mix this with nucleic, with lipid, to give stable nucleic acid lipid particles, SNOLPs or SNALPs, and then you inject monkeys with Ebola virus, and then a number of times after injection, one, two, three, four, and five days, and six days after challenge, you give them this stuff, and it protects them from dying. So it works. And Feldman is very negative because he says we'll never get the money to develop this, and he's probably right. So this is for, there are no vaccines for Ebola. There are no drugs. So this is for someone who gets infected with Ebola, a needle stick accident in a hospital, or someone who gets infected in the wild. Uh, you could give them siRNA treatment to save their life. Um, how far after infection you could treat them, we don't know, but they could determine that. But the problem is, how many Ebola infections are there every year that you really know are Ebola? Right. Less than 20. Even if there's less than 100, there's, that's not a market, right? No, clearly not. And so it would probably cost between two and $300 million to do all the testing to get this licensed, and nobody's going to spend that. And that's why Feldman is negative. What do you think about that? Getting it licensed, um, there, there's, there are a whole set of barriers to getting it licensed. Um, and money is only one of them. Uh, there's the issue that how do you prove efficacy? Well, you can only use animals, I guess, right? Right. So you're going to have to, ultimately, you're going to have to have something that has proven efficacy in animals, not been tested in humans, and it's going to go into humans during some kind of incident. Yeah. 
Um, and this is actually permitted. Uh, this there was oh, just a little while ago. There was an, an incident like this um, where I think it was an Ebola lab. Um, somebody had a needle stick and they gave her an experimental vaccine. Yeah, right. Um, right. We talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's the kind of situation where this would likely be used. And for something like that, you don't really need approval. Well, you'd it's, like to know it's safe, though, right? You would. And for that, you'd want to certainly test it more in animals. So what yeah. was? How many animals did they test here? Uh, not many. Um, I mean, it's monkeys, so it's difficult and costly. Yeah, they... Uh, three. Three monkeys. Okay. Two of three, given post-exposure treatments, were protected from infection. And all macaques, given... Seven post-exposure treatments were protected. So rhesus, the f are the more expensive. Right. And macaques are cheaper. Right. But yeah, you'd need some some safety and bioavailability studies, which would cost less than a clinical trial, I suppose, because you do those in animals. But um, yeah, and they they'd actually cost substantially less because you, the safety and bio bioavailability are phase one uh, or combined phase one, phase two, and if that's as far as you need to go. And this could be, this could be doable. It's certainly in the context of uh, of a Department of Defense budget, where yeah, you know, if it costs a few million dollars to do the Phase One trial, that's a, kind of a rounding error on a B one bomber. That's right. I was going to say that, in terms of uh, military equipment, this is not a lot. Right. But I do think the government should do do something like this. Right. This, if no company wants to take it forward, the government should provide the hundred million dollars. It's right. not a lot of money. And right, where the, they, where the market has failed to address a real problem that's an appropriate place for government intervention. Yeah. Or Bill Gates could do it. He could fund it. He could. Yeah. I, I think he's focused on stuff that's a you know, bigger public health right. threat. Right, right. Um, because that's the other argument is, yeah, it's really unfortunate for the 20 people a year who this might apply to, if that. Um, but would this be the best use of resources? Right. I'm trying to get an estimate here of the number of outbreak Ebola. Let's see, Ebola, how many each year? All right, so there have been 1,500 so far. Two-thirds have have died. In the history of the virus. In the history of the virus, yeah. Uh, 1,500 in, when was it discovered? 70, 76. Six. Yeah. So 34 years. Right. Right. 50 a year? Yeah, yeah, so that's not pharmaceutical company uh, targeted. That's right. the problem. So a government will have to do this. So that's our take, Andreas. Um, I think it's a good it's a good approach because um, it works, and as long as it's safe and has no other effects. You always wonder if siRNA have what we call off-target effects and right. uh, could affect your own genes, which would not be good, and that's only something you would know in a safety study. Okay, next one is from Ken. Hello, doctors. V R A D. Vincent, Rich, Allen, and Dixon. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, V Rad. V Rad. My name is. Oh boy, I'm sorry, sir, that I'm going to massacre your name. Uh, I'll try Agemon Badu Kenyo. Okay. A graduate student in Ghana, and a regular listener to Twiv and Twip. I came across an article in Cell, a paper by Zhang et al., and I have a question about priming of non-enveloped viruses before cell entry. If viruses are really particles before cell entry and hijack the cell machinery to act as living and replicate, how is it possible for non-enveloped viruses like parvoviruses, adenoviruses, Coxsackie viruses, and even hepatitis delta virus to prime from a dormant state to a metastable state by shedding off protective proteins before cell entry. How can a viral particle release proteins if it is not in a cell? I tried reaching the original authors but couldn't and hope you geniuses could help me answer this question. Uh, no geniuses here. <laughs> Just virologists. That's right. Maybe there's something I don't know and I would like you to fill the gap in my knowledge like Okazaki fragments. <laughs> Great. I like That's that. That's good. That's good. Thanks, and keep up the good work. You are really helping some of us now coming into the molecular research field. Ken. Ah, Ken. All right. Good. I'm sorry about the name, Ken, but he, Ken is from Ghana. Um, 
so he sent us a paper, which is a structural paper on um, a, a real virus, basically. And uh, let me find it here. What did I do with it? Oh, here it is in my PDF reader. And so, Ken, basically the idea is that nothing happens outside the cell. Viruses have to get into the cell to be primed, to be uncoded. For example, the paper you, you sent is a real virus paper. And what happens with real viruses is that the outer layer of the particle is removed by proteases that are present in the endosome of the cell. And that makes the particle competent to penetrate the endosome and get into the cytoplasm. All right, so nothing happens outside of the cell. That's why they're metastable. They can travel from cell to cell or from person to person without spontaneously releasing their nucleic acid. But when they contact and get into a cell, the right environment is provided. In the case of real viruses, it's an endosomal protease. For other viruses, it's low endosomal pH. And for polio, as Alan knows, it's the receptor. The polio virus hits the receptor, and that causes the virus to uncoat right at the cell surface. Right. So that is, I think that's your trouble. You Nothing happens until the virus gets into the cell. Is that an accurate um, right? Representation? Right. The virus. The well, in fact, the reason Vince believes viruses are non-living, perhaps, is that um, outside the cell they just sit there. They're they're not doing anything. They're not priming anything. Um, they have to wait until they have contact with uh, with a receptor or some other machinery mm -hmm. from the cell, and that triggers them to be primed and uncoated. Right. Now, it turns out that this is an interesting paper because um, in this particular virus, when the outer layer of the capsid is removed by this endosomal protease, and by the way, the endosome is a vesicle in a cell that is involved in taking up material from the outside of the cell and bringing it in. So that outer layer of the virus is removed in the endosome, and that allows the inner layer of the capsid to undergo a self cleavage reaction. So it's actually an autoprotease. There's an autoprotease in the viral capsid that allows cleavage, and that's important for the entry process as well. And then what happens next is a part of the, pro the viral protein has some meristic acid. It's a hydrophobic uh, lipid on the end. It comes out and it pokes into the endosome membrane, and that's probably part of the mechanism for the virus to get out of the endosome and into the cytoplasm. So there's a, a series of steps Removal of the outer shell by an endosomal protease, autoproteolytic cleavage of the inner capsid, and then the extrusion of this hydrophobic, they call it a finger, membrane insertion finger into the membrane. Okay? It's a cool paper. It is cool. Damon writes, Dear professors, I'm writing to more or less ask for a sanity check on the topic of flu vaccination. You may have come to the wrong place for a sanity check. <laughs> Uh, Damon, this is from Damon, who is actually in Massachusetts. Ah. Oh. When my company began operation of a flu laboratory, our medical director mandated twice yearly flu vaccinations. Now, these are the normal seasonal vaccines, not the strains we are working with, but the hope is that there would be some cross protection. That I can buy as a risk mitigation approach. However, I originally assumed that the vaccine we receive in the spring was the Southern Hemisphere vaccine, which would give us even broader influenza immunity. I recently learned that this is not the case. In the spring, we receive another shot of the same vaccine we were given the preceding fall. The justification for this is ostensibly, right? Ostensibly. Ostensibly, yes. Not V, yeah. That right. the repeated shot will compensate for waning immunity. I'm tempted to call shenanigans on this because I can find no evidence that flu immunity provided by a vaccine wanes, especially over a time period as short as six months. In fact, flu immunity against particular strains seems to be lifelong, as evidenced by the finding that people exposed to a similar flu decades ago had resistance to the latest H1N1. What are your opinions on this? Is there any benefit to receiving an identical flu shot twice in a row? Well, uh, Damon, it's... Depends what kind of vaccine you get. The the inactivated flu vaccines don't have long lasting, don't confer long lasting immunity. It does wane eight months to a year, depending on your age. If you're older, it wanes even quicker. So giving two is not a bad idea. So what we do usually in the fall, you get your shot. It protects you through the winter, 
and then you get another one the following fall, but your immunity has probably waned before that. Now, if your boss wants to protect you against lab infections, it would make sense to give another shot in the spring. And again, if you have a range of age ages and the people working there, that would even make more sense. So I don't think there's shenanigans involved. I think he, he, he or she, the medical director, is just being careful. Now, if you're using an inactivated vaccine, the fact is that it's not lifelong immunity. It's uh, less than a year, really. Now, the lifelong immunity that you mentioned is when you get infected with a virus. Uh, it's replicating in you. They get a very robust, long-lived memory response. So there are two very different things. The inactivated vaccine doesn't give you good memory, so it's not very long-lived. So, now, yeah. a quick a quick search on this. Um, I I'm, There may be other papers on this, but I found one that popped up to the top from Vaccine in May of 2005. Uh, authors are McElhaney et al. Um, and they looked at, uh, they compared single versus a booster dose of flu vaccine, and they looked at the immune responses. Um, and this appears to have been in an elderly population. Mm -hmm. So they separated the vaccines by do, 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 16 weeks. Um, so not quite six months, four months. Um, and they saw the single dose gave them a TH1 and a cytotoxic lymphocyte, lymphocyte response. The booster seems to have tamped down um, that response a little bit to produce more of a TH2 response. Um, so it does, it may change the immunological profile. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know what that's going to mean when you actually get exposed to the virus. Just throwing it out there. Yeah. No, I think the uh, in over 65, it wanes very quickly. And in fact, they are experimenting with a higher dose in that population. Right. Getting people back twice a year for flu is flu vaccine is tough. Right. Of course, if you're in a company, you have to do what they tell you to do, I guess. Right. If you're, especially if you're working with it. Yeah, but the um, the upshot, I I also I, I don't think I'd really call shenanigans on it. I, there's not I, there's not a huge argument for it, but it seems like maybe a prudent thing to do. Yeah, it is if prudent. Gonna, yeah. If you're going to be working with, especially if you're going to be working with samples of the virus on a daily basis, um, it uh, probably won't hurt you to get two shots separated by six months, and uh, it may help. But on, on the other hand, Damon, if it's he says it's not the same strains you're working with, maybe there'll be some cross-protection. Mm. That seems a little dicey. I mean, you have to be a little more certain of what you're immunizing against. You don't want to hope for cross-protection. You should be sure that there's going to be some cross-protection against what you're working with. Well, they should they should take some titers on the employees. Yeah, he also says he was surprised at the same vaccine in the spring and as in the fall. Well, you know, in fact, this the vaccine we're getting this fall for for the next season's influenza is the same that that we got last year, and it's the same that the southern hemisphere has received for its flu season, which is now. So, that's very typical. A related question: Why is it that pets need to be revaccinated yearly when most human vaccines provide lifelong immunity? Well, it turns out that pets probably don't need to be revaccinated yearly. And there's I did a search on this, and there's a lot of controversy. You know, the vets like you to come in every year and get your pets immunized. Can you guess why? <laughs> Cha-ching. So there haven't been any good studies to say whether we need that or not. So now there is a big movement afoot to try and delay it and not do it every year because you don't really need it. Um. And then, yes, so most of those vaccines probably do uh, confer a longer immunity than than we think. So that's your answer. I don't think they're fundamentally any different. I don't think the pets are fundamentally any different in terms of their immune responses as we are. Thanks for all the fulfilling commutes provided by TWIV. All right. Bedford. You know where Bedford is? Yes, I know where Bedford is. Is it near you? Uh, it's, on the, it's on the other side of the state, okay. but it's not that big a state. All right, let's do one more. And Alan, would you mind reading this last one? Okay, well, Dan uh, writes, Twiv Crew, your recent interview with Dr. Kiki that touched on press releases and sometimes misconstrued information by the media relates well to this story in Wired magazine. Uh, and he includes the URL and attaches a PDF. 
um, you might want to consider a short mention of it in your program. And uh, the article that he that he links to um, is a piece from Wired called Why Science Needs to Step Up Its PR Game. Um, this was from June 2010. Um, and then Dan continues, as a meteorologist, I now find myself in a field where the public's perception of the science is now heavily influenced by public politics and public opinion. Case in point, global warming, climate change. It used to be that a meteorologist only had to worry about a forecast, improving a numerical model, or better ways to assimilate or improve data for analyses and models. But now we have to fend off a growing public upset, uh, a growing upset public um, that have received erroneous information about climate change. It's ironic that I chose this field to help humanity. I figured a better forecast could only help mankind make better decisions that would benefit everyone, but because of strong opinion, some of my colleagues are now more worried about a direct physical assault on their own person or families than the science. Uh, that is certainly a sad state of affairs. The improvement in communication is a two-edged sword. Not only does it allow for the wonderful opportunity of free access to knowledge, a uh, dream that I share with you, but it also allows for the un uneducated to voice a quote-unquote equal opinion. And uh, he continues to uh, uh, talk about the the importance of research dollars and uh, link to link of public relations and public relations to public understanding. So he concludes um, uh, to a degree, you folks are doing what this article advocates. Your audience is wide open, and you do a great job of of taking the science to layperson's level. But to what extent do we go? And what is the best way to reach those who have open minds before they meet the entity that has an apparent agenda to coerce their beliefs so they will perhaps vote a specific way in the next election that might very well have a bearing on research funding for basic science? Uh, it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so the article says in, in Wired is basically saying we should step up our PR, scientists, that is. And it's basically, it, to a certain extent, that's what we're doing here on TWIV, right? Sure. I mean, we're not going to, we're not lobbying Congress, which is part of what they're suggesting. But they're saying, uh, scientists have withdrawn from the sphere of public culture. They have contempt for the lighthearted fun of communication. I think they're right. I think that uh, more of us need to communicate what we are doing. Yes. Um, so we agree completely with this and that's why we do twiv and we think that other scientists should do podcasts in their own fields as well you know it's unfortunate that we have well I, I i like educating the public because if they understand what we're doing they are more likely to see the value in government support of our research right not everybody can do it it does take time and some kind of skills i suppose but even setting aside the um you know the the sort of selfish point that you need the public to understand research that they're underwriting. Um, I've come to believe that having an informed public is what we need to be a strong country. Um, you know, increasingly the world around us that, that we interact with is dominated by science and technology. And if you don't understand what's behind that, then you're really at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Um, so if the question is how do we compete in a global job market or how do we, uh, you know, revive industry or whatever, whatever it is that concerns you in your daily life, there is, there is probably a lot of science involved in the answer. And, um, I think to the extent that we have, we have failed to communicate how science works in public schools, um, we've really, we've really failed to provide basic tools for people to uh, to be productive citizens. Yeah, even he's right though we don't have uh we don't have a lot of money to do this. He, no. we, he says you don't have the resources of giant corporations. Yeah, we don't. But uh it, it's very easy to educate the public as you know. We have a lot of listeners who love learning about viruses. Yeah, there's an audience out there and and it's uh, not a not a really small audience. It's not. And if we keep doing it, we will teach someone every week and the audience will grow. And if other fields do it, um, people can pick what they listen to. And I think that's that's part of moving towards what this article is suggesting. So I, I agree. Right. He says, I value your comments, candor, and intelligent discourse. I always look forward to listening your show to your show during my daily commute. 
Well, we have a couple of commuters here in this yeah. uh, series of emails. Then he asks about the Drobo contest. He he had submitted an entry and would like to uh, see them. Maybe I could learn from my mistakes, since the lack of a Drobo on my desk is evidence I didn't get it right. <laughs> Actually, they were they, they were quite close, Dan. We will. Yeah. At, I will at some point post uh, the the uh, essays. With like the top five or something like that. They were quite close. Yeah, it was actually, it was very hard. There there were a couple of them that were very clearly off base. Um, yeah. You know, but I think most folks made a, a serious effort at it, and they, the final decision was really very difficult. <laughs> yeah, but at some point we shall post a bunch of them, and you can see what the competition was. I wouldn't say you didn't get it right, because you made an effort, and that really counts, and it wasn't an easy question. You may not have, uh, you know, we're all, we're professors here, so we score things. We're tough guys. <laughs> um, did I say that was the last one? Yeah, we, uh, could, yeah, we guess we could stop there. Yeah, we've we've taken up a fair amount of people's time at this yeah, point, and they want to bar, they want to get to their barbecues. So, right. All right, what have you got for a pick of the week, Alan? Uh, my pick of the week is a picture. Um, it's actually a page of pictures, but the one uh, the one right up at the top is the one that I. And picking, it is the tree of life. Um, now you've probably seen pictures of phylogenetic trees before, if you're listening to Twiv. But this one is a, um, a lab at University of Texas, and they did. Um, uh, this is based on um, ribosomal RNA sequences, I think, um, and they have plotted a phylogenetic tree of. Plants, animals, fungi, protists, archaea, um, and put it all all the way out to species. Um, and it's not all the known species, but it's uh, it's thousands upon thousands of them. So when you look at this picture on your screen, what you see is this branching network coming out from the center. It's arranged as a circle, mm -hmm. and you see, um, which by the way, Darwin's very first phylogenetic trees were drawn in in sort of a curved fashion um so it's it's actually we're kind of back to the future on this um <laughs> drawing them in circles and around the outside of the circle when you look at it on your computer screen it looks like there's kind of a fuzzy line <laughs> but if you zoom in on that line you see those are species names wow written in very very small print and they um uh they say i, I think i'm going to have this done um, it's free. You can you can download the PDF. It's a very high resolution PDF, and they suggest printing it at least fifty four inches wide, um, which you can uh, you can do at your Kinkos or what have you. Um, they'll do big format prints um, and make it into a wall poster. Cool. So I think I may I may go ahead and do that, and I thought others might too. It's neat, but notice, Alan, there are no viruses on this tree of life. No, there are no viruses on this tree of life. And, <laughs> and I think that's because the viruses would be the ring around the outside, yeah. lording it over everything. Well, as they say, viruses are polyphyletic, so yes. it's very hard to make a tree like this. I notice that some people on this page have tree of life tattoos. Yes, that's oh, further down the page. Some graduate students. Hmm. Yep. Had tattoos on their back. Very large tattoos of the tree yep. of life. Cool. Take a look. Not all the way down to species, though. Nope. Can't do much. You can't do that detail, I guess, right? Right. Oh, and the, the poster, the Tree of Life poster, also has a you are here designation. Yeah, it does. Look at that. Yep, <laughs> over cool. there in the animals. It's great. Yep. Great. Very cool. Uh, my pick is a TED site, TEDx, it's called. And this is a um, site separate from the TED Talks, which you may remember we've talked about in, because Dixon de Pommier uh, was a TED speaker last year. Right. This is TEDx Oil Spill. This is a series of videos having to do with the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, all different sorts. And one that I particularly like is by a microbiologist, which discusses using a bacteria to try and deal with the spill. So there are right now... I don't know, five or six or seven different videos, and they add them. They add them to them. They're about, well, they range in, from an hour to two hours long, but it's pretty timely and interesting, and well, it covers all aspects of the of the spill, which of course is a science issue, 
as well as a political issue and an economic issue and everything else issue. So that's uh, the TEDx oil spill. Cool. And that will do it for another TWIV. And there are many ways you can listen to TWIV. You can listen at iTunes, the Zune Marketplace. In both places, you can subscribe for free, of course, and automatically get the new podcasts as they are uploaded. If you don't use either of you's, try of those, try Stitcher Radio. It's a free app for iPhone, iPod Touch, iPad, BlackBerry, Palm, Pre, Pixie, Google, Android devices. You download the app at bit.ly slash stitchtwiv. It's a free app, and it streams the show to your device so you don't have to download it. You can always download episodes at twiv.tv, where we also have show notes and, of course, all the letters and our picks of the week are archived there as well. If you like Twiv, please tell others about it. And a link, <clears throat> excuse me, a link is always nice on your blog or website. And a review in iTunes, in iTunes helps us stay on the front featured page of the Medicine Podcasts. Twiv is part of microbeworld.org, sciencepodcasters.org, and promednetwork.com, websites where you can find high-quality science in a wide variety of fields. As always, do send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. Thanks for coming again, Alan. Always a pleasure. Hope you have a good fourth weekend. Anything interesting planned? Oh, going to go down and visit the in-laws. Oh, excellent. Is that yeah. here in New York City? Uh, it's it's right north of New York City. Cool. In, uh, yeah. Well, enjoy the traffic. Ah, uh, yeah. It's going to be a thrill. You can find Alan at DoveDocs.com or AlanDove.com. Read about what he has to say, his own version of Twitter and Facebook. That's right, is the AlanDove.com site. Or if you just want to read the serious stuff, you can read the DoveDocs site. Alan is a very serious guy, except yes. when he's humorous. And you can find me at Virology.ws. And next week we will have Rich Condit back and Alan. Yep. Do we have a guest next week? Let's take a look here. And yes, upcoming episodes of TWIV. Do we have a guest uh, on the 9th? On the 9th of July, we have um, Eric Donaldson. Eric Donaldson. Oh, that'll be fun. Oh, it's going to be a full house. You've got Dick listed as being Yeah, on. probably Dick is not going to be there. He won't be there. So yeah, Eric Donaldson is doing the bat viral metagenomics. Nice. He uh, has now done a lot of sequencing. He's going to tell us what he has found. He's from North Carolina, so that'll be fun. Great. You have been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>